talk about deep learning, not surprisingly. Uh, my name is uh, Yann Lequin in French, Yann Lequin in English, and Yann Le Kuhn in Chinese. Um, and uh, I, um, I um, am a professor at NYU, just right next door. I'm also the director of Facebook AI Research. Um, and um, let, let me tell you a few words about Facebook AI Research first. Uh, so, and also a few words about uh, NYU. I'm sure many of you um, know some of the activities at NYU. So a few years ago, I founded the uh, Center for Data Science at NYU, which is uh, a center focused on all the methods and the applications of deriving knowledge from data. That's what data science, that's, that's the way I view data science, deriving knowledge from data. And increasingly, that process involves what we now call AI, which really is, you know, kind of sophisticated machine learning methods. And I'll talk about the potential applications of this, the current applications, as well as the, the limits of it and what we're working on to go beyond those limits. Um, so, um, I spend, of course, most of my time um, um, at Facebook, uh, which is, uh, I'm based in, at uh, the Facebook New York office, which is very close to here uh, on Astor Place. It's uh, just five minutes work from here. So, that makes it very convenient. And uh, we have, at Facebook AI Research, we have uh, four uh, locations in New York, in Menlo Park in California, in Paris. And two weeks ago, we announced uh, the creation of a new lab in Montreal and which actually has been operating for a few months, but um, we made the official announcement just two weeks ago. Uh, Facebook Air Research has about 110 researchers and engineers, research scientists and engineers, and uh, work on all aspects of, of AI uh, in sort of advanced research, developing new algorithms, new methods, new principles, new theory. So it's very much sort of uh, on, the, on the research side of, of things. And then there is another group at Facebook also uh, called Applied Machine Learning, which is actually quite a bit bigger than, than FAIR, that works on the sort of applying uh, AI methods for, uh, for Facebook, providing the technology to the engineering groups. And there is a, a lot of people at Facebook also kind of um, developing products around those technologies. In fact, you could argue that Facebook today could not exist uh, without the current version of AI. A lot of systems at, at, at Facebook uh, use uh, deep learning and neural nets and, and sort of AI techniques. Um, so I'm going to be addressing a number of questions. Some of them are a little philosophical, but some of them are really sort of, you know, technological and scientific questions. And uh, I was recently at a, at a conference uh, in, at Columbia University a few weeks ago, and uh, I had a keynote there, and right before me, uh, a professor from MIT, Josh Tenenbaum, who is a cognitive science uh, uh, researcher, uh, said this, he said, all these AI systems that we see, none of them is real AI. And what he meant by this, and I agree with him, um, what he means by this is that uh, th what we can do with our, our current machine learning system is very limited. We can train them in supervised mode, we can train them with you know, certain forms of reinforcement learning, but that limits the type of problems that we can solve with them. It generally uh, is limited to very narrow domains, and we have no idea how to build generally intelligent machines. We have no idea how to get machines to learn like humans and, and animals do. So, there is a lot of hype about AI, and to somewhat, it's somewhat deserved because there is a lot of really nice applications of AI, and it's going to revolutionize, uh, uh, you know, a lot of corners of the economy and society. Um, but, it's very limited still, and we need to do the research today to kind of go beyond those limitations. So here's the paradigm that we all uh, use, all, all the AI systems you've, you've heard about that actually work in practice, essentially use supervised learning, and then there's a tiny number that use uh, what's called reinforcement learning, I'll come to this a bit later. And in supervised learning, what you do is you, um, you want to, for example, train a machine to distinguish uh, cars from airplanes. You show it thousands of examples of cars and airplanes, and every time you show an example to the machine, you tell it what the correct answer is. You show it a car, you tell it you know, the output should be car. If the output is car, you don't do anything. If the output is not car, then you adjust the internal parameters of the machine, symbolized by those knobs here, uh, so that the output the machine produces gets closer to the output you want. Okay, and you do this with thousands of examples of cars and airplanes, and eventually the uh, knobs settle into a configuration that uh, will make it recognize any car and any plane, even cars and planes it's never seen before. So that's a bit the magic of machine learning. And the magic of deep learning is that you don't have to do a lot of 
engineering to uh, train those machines. They are, you know, very often very generic. So what, uh, you know, the, the new AI, what people call AI nowadays, really is deep learning. And what that means is essentially two major approaches. One is conventional neural networks. The other one is recurrent neural networks. So the, the reason it's called deep learning is, is that uh, in the past, when we wanted to build a pattern recognition system, we would take, uh, let's say, an image, and we would have to work on engineering what's called a feature extractor, which turns the raw image into a kind of simple representation, essentially a list of numbers that describe uh, the content of the image, if you want. But that, that module had to be uh, designed by hand, engineered. Um, and then, you know, we could plug a, a trainable classifier on top of it, which, you know, could be relatively simple. What deep learning uh, brought to the table is this uh, diagram on the bottom where uh, the, the entire system is composed of a cascade of multiple modules, and all of them are trainable, and they're all trained simultaneously, right? So you, you put an image at the input, wait for the answer, adjust all the, all the parameters in all the boxes so that the answer gets closer to what you want. And that essentially allows the system to learn the task end-to-end -end with very little human engineering, and that means it's widely applicable to a lot of data without too much effort. Um, so today what that means is that the, the kind of operations that are required uh, for implementing those neural nets is, uh, is very, very simple. Essentially, there's only three operations you need for everything, multiplication, addition, and comparison. That's about it. So if you can do those three operations in a particular organization of them very, very fast, then you can run neural nets very fast. And, uh, you know, essentially it consists in, you know, you want to recognize images or signals or whatever. You, you know, uh, to a computer, an image is a table of numbers, right? It's the value of each pixel. Um, and a signal is also a table of numbers or a, an array of numbers. So the input to the system is a list of numbers representing the pixel values or whatever. Um, and then what you do is you compute multiple weighted sums of those values and then compare them to a threshold. If it's below the threshold, the uh, output of the corresponding node is going to be zero. If it's, if it's above the threshold, it's, you know, it's going to be some non-zero number. Um, and you do this with you know, lots of different configurations of the weights. So this is mathematically equivalent to taking a vector, multiplying it by a matrix, and then taking all the components and running them through a, a, non -linear, a set of nonlinear operations uh, like the one symbolized here. Um, and then you repeat the same operation again, weighted sums, again, those nonlinear uh, operations, etc. You stack those things. And, and the beauty of uh, the learning algorithm is that it's you know, basically mathematically known as uh, large scale uh, optimization of a function in high dimensional space. So you can measure how well the machine is doing by you know, comparing the output the machine produces with the one you get. And that gives you kind of a cost value. You average this over a large training set. And that gives you sort of a, a measure of how badly the machine is doing. And what you're trying to do is adjust all the knobs in the machine, all those coefficients in those matrices, all those weights, in such a way that this cost goes down. So it's kind of like, you know, walking in the mountains and sort of trying to find the, the valley, the village in the valley. And you're in a fog, right? So the only thing you can get is the direction where to go down. So there's a, a very efficient technique that goes back many years ago. In fact, the mathematical basis for it goes back to you know, Newton and Leibniz. But the realization that you could use it for training neural nets goes back to the early 80s or late 70s, depending on who you believe. And they, the uh, idea is to send a signal. You don't, don't, don't worry about the equations. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but the idea is to kind of back propagate a, a signal back to the, the, the network backwards. And that will give you an indication for every node that is adjustable, every coefficient in all those matrices, in which way you need to adjust it so that the output gets closer to the one you want, okay? That's called a backpropagation algorithm, and it's used everywhere. Now, um, now the next question you have to ask yourself is, okay, you know, I know how to multiply matrices, you know, vectors by matrices, but really I need to build the architecture of the system, like know which value to connect to which other value in such a way that the, the system knows something about, the, about the, the nature of the data. And that led to an invention many years ago. This is when I was working at Bell Labs in New Jersey. Um, it was the research uh, arm of uh, the company AT&T at the time. Uh, now it belongs to Nokia, but uh, it still has the name Bell Labs. Um, and Bell Labs, if you don't know about it, is uh, you know, the research institution that essentially where all the sort of 
technology that's used by the modern world was invented. The transistor, uh, the laser, the uh, solar cell, uh, cell, you know, telecommunication satellite, um, you know, Unix, uh, the, the C++ and C language, you know, all of that was invented at Bell Labs. So I was there in the late 80s and early 90s, and I came up with this um, particular architecture of a neural net called convolutional net. And I'm going to explain in details how it works, but it's um, sort of based on a little, of a little bit of inspiration from biology. So there was, you know, classic work in neuroscience that where neuroscientists examine the anatomy of the visual cortex, the, you know, the part of the brain in the back here that processes visual information, and figured out how the neurons were connected and had some hypothesis about what function they were, they were using. And uh, in Japan in the 80s, a gentleman by the name of Kunohiko Fukushima uh, came up with sort of a, a model he called the neocognitron, which was sort of a computational model of this idea. And we, he kind of managed to make it work more or less, but he didn't have the right learning algorithm. Um, he didn't know about backpropagation. Uh, it didn't exist yet. So uh, what I did was kind of, you know, get inspiration from, from this work and then um, combine this with the backpropagation algorithm uh, for the, 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 the convolutional net. And this is a, a convolutional net um, uh, that uh, my, colleague, my colleagues and I built in the uh, early 90s, um, around 1990 or so, that is trained to recognize handwritten digits. So at the time, we couldn't train very large neural nets because the computers were not powerful enough. And there were very, very few problems for which we had enough data to train it. Uh, the only uh, domain for which there was enough data was handwriting recognition and uh, speech recognition. Uh, and it worked really well for handwriting recognition, not so well for speech recognition, because it turns out for speech, the networks you need to train are very, very large, and we just didn't have the powerful enough machines at the time. So that gives you an idea of the internal state of the neural net. So that's the input, and that's the First layer, each pixel corresponds to the activation of a single node, like a, a simulated neuron, if you want. And um, there is, you know, various types of operations here. That's called a pooling operation. I'm not going to go into the details. And so as you go up the layers, the representation that the machine has of the world is more and more abstract, more high level. Uh, and towards the end, it can actually recognize characters. So, it can, you know, it could do things like this, not even just recognize single characters, but recognize multiple characters. Um, and we had... Uh, implementations of this on special chips that, that could run, you know, relatively quickly for the time. So eventually what, what happened is that we built uh, a system to recognize zip codes and checks, and the, the check reading system was deployed commercially, quite widely actually, so um, by the late 1990s, the, the system was reading about 20% of all the bank checks in the U.S., um, and it was based on this idea of commercial nets. But by that time, the research community in uh, machine learning uh, lost interest in neural net research. And so, um, uh, you know, around 1995 or so, people got, in the machine learning community, got interested in other methods that were simpler to handle. These methods were actually quite complex. It was complex to make them work. The software you had to write to kind of implement them was sort of somewhat, somewhat complicated. And this was before the days of the internet and open source code and everything, so you had to kind of write your own. Uh, so it was difficult for us, for example, to kind of distribute our software. Um, and, um, and, and so the, the community just completely lost interest in, uh, in these kind of methods. And I actually stopped working on machine learning from 1996 to 2002, roughly. Um, I worked on image compression. Um, but, but in 2003, or in 2002, I left at and I briefly went to work for the company, Japanese company NEC in Princeton, and then I joined NYU in 2003. And I restarted working on neural nets, and uh, a few colleagues and, and, and I, uh, Jeffrey Hinton at University of Toronto and Yosha Benjo at University of Montreal, got together and decided to restart, renew the interest of the research community into those methods because we thought ultimately they were the answer if we had powerful computers and big data sets. And so we started working on this again, and around 2010-11, the, um, uh, Jeff Hinton in particular started to have really, really good success with speech recognition using those methods. Um, and I had been pushing uh, work on convolutional nets as well for image recognition, but, um, and Jeff um, and his students uh, uh, figured out how to implement those convolutional nets really efficiently on GPUs, which are the graphic cards uh, that are designed for game rendering, but they, they're really powerful for numerical computing. They're very appropriate for, for neural nets, and trained this very gigantic neural net with, for the time, uh, known as AdexNet, around 2012, 
which had something like 1 billion connections and 20 layers and was trained with 1 million training samples on the ImageNet data set. And with this, they won the ImageNet uh, competition. So this is a competition where you, you know, all the universities and research labs kind of enter and you know, try to get the best uh, error rate. And their error rate was about, ha about half of what the state of the art was uh, at that time. And so all of a sudden, the computer vision community started paying attention to those methods. And the, the community went from ignoring those methods to completely embracing them uh, in about two years. And, uh, and now the vast majority of papers in computer vision conferences use convolutional nets. Um, so um, let's see. Over the last few years, well, we've, we've seen a, an inflation in the number of layers of those networks. So people have started exploring a lot of uh, new ideas about how you can build those networks. You know, uh, having lots of layers, having very complex architecture. This is uh, one of my former students participated, uh, you know, joined Google and participated in uh, an effort at Google. And they, you know, my network used to be called LeNet and they called them Google Net. Um, so the Google version, if you want. Uh, and more recently, a gentleman by the name of uh, Kai Ming He who uh, at the time was at Microsoft Research Asia in Beijing, came up with this really nice idea called ResNet. And I'm not gonna go into the details of what it does, but it's got this really cool idea of um, having you know, connections that kind of skip pairs of layers. And he beat a bunch of records with this, and it was very impressive. Uh, we were so impressed by it actually at, at Facebook that we, we hired Kai Ming, and now he's a research scientist at Facebook in, in California in Menlo Park. Um, and uh, these sort of follow-up ideas at, at, uh, at, at Facebook that kind of built on this uh, idea, something called DanceNet, which I'm gonna go into. Um, so this idea of, of hierarchy works because um, the, the, the nature of, of, of the world, you know, the perceptual world, uh, vision, the visual world is, is compositional. Images have you know, there are, you can see them as scenes and they are composed of objects and objects are composed of parts and parts are composed of motifs and motifs are composed of really elementary features like, you know, corners and circles and things like this. And those are composed of assembly, you know, compositions of, of edges, for example, in images. And the, this like multi-layer architecture essentially can do this and build this, this compositional hierarchy by detecting uh, edges, let's say, so those are, uh, little set of coefficients that will detect edges at various orientations. And then those edges are assembled into combinations of uh, those edges are uh, detected to form uh, motifs. And those are you know, combined so that combinations of those detect things like parts of objects, et cetera. So th this natural hierarchy to the world. And in fact, that's probably what makes the world understandable for, for us, not just for machines, but for, for people as well. Um, in, the, in just a few years from, uh, you know, it took, when, when we tr were training our, our neural nets on, on character rec for character recognition, there were very, very small neural nets compared to what we can do now. Um, it, would, it would take us something like two weeks on a, on a computer of the time. And at XNet, when it first came out uh, in 2012, um, you know, it would take about two weeks also to train on a, on a, on, a, on a GPU, maybe on two GPU cards simultaneously. Uh, now there is so much interest in this and so much effort that has gone into parallelizing those things and optimizing the software that we can basically train a bigger networks like ResNet uh, on a network of uh, uh, computers with multiple GPU cards in them in about an hour. Uh, so there is a uh, huge progress in, in hardware technology and software technology and it's, it's gonna make even more progress uh, as we go. Um, but going back a little historically, the, we did some work in uh, around 2003 uh, of trying to train um, a little truck, a radio control truck to drive itself using a convolutional net. So the convolutional net is fed with images from cameras and uh, it's just trained to emulate the, the steering angle that a human would produce. So you have a human drive this little truck for about 20 minutes in various environments and, um, and then you use that data to train the machine to emulate the human. And what you could see in the video here was essentially the, the truck kind of driving itself um, in this kind of busy backyard here and sort of avoiding all the obstacles. Uh, this is just the, the conventional net kind of driving the, uh, driving the system. Very simple demonstration. We showed this to uh, people at uh, DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. It's a funding agency for our research and development in, um, you know, uh, 
funded by the, the Department of Defense. And they say, well, that looks really cool. We should start a program on using machine learning to drive robots in, uh, in nature. They were really interested in that. So uh, this was a, a project called Lagger, Learning Applied to Ground Robots. Uh, and um, the idea that we used in this uh, project was to use convolutional nets to essentially help the system determine whether a particular location is drivable or whether it's an obstacle. And this worked really well. I can actually show you perhaps a piece of this if I can find my pointer. Uh, let's see, yeah, this one. So this is the, uh, the convolutional net that's used and it's applied to the image and then once we um, have uh, a label for every pixel in the image, we can put this back into a map that's centered on a robot and then do planning in the map to go to a particular goal. Uh, and, and the system can kind of drive itself. This at the time was uh, running directly on the robot. The, uh, the robot had three laptop-like uh, computers in its belly. Uh, okay, let me show you this, that's fun. Okay, so that's a, a little sequence. This is sped up twice, where the robot is supposed to go to the, some location at back, but those pesky students are preventing it from going there and it's getting slightly annoyed. Uh, but the students are quite sure the robot is not gonna break their legs because they actually wrote the code for it and they trained it. So eventually it figures, out, figures it out. Uh, more recently, uh, we've been uh, at NYU collaborating with uh, a group from the company NVIDIA, so the same company that makes the, the GPUs. And they, um, And they've been working on using the, the same idea uh, of the little truck. In fact, the people working at NVIDIA on the on self-driving car project are actually the same people that worked, that I collaborated with to, to work on this little robot and this, uh, just this video I just showed you. Um, they, they moved, they moved to, to NVIDIA and they're now working on the project. So this is before the system is properly trained. It's been trained only a, a little bit. And after uh, you know, a few hours of training data of basically learning to just emulate a human driver by figuring out the steering angle um, you know, being trained on several hours of uh, recorded um, uh, video together with the steering angle, this car can drive itself in sort of weird environments, you know, including forests and can avoid unexpected obstacles and, and things like that. Um, so, you know, now it, it's, um, I'm, you know, I'm told this, this actually can, can, can drive a car for quite a number of hours without any human intervention uh, fairly reliably. And oddly enough, the, the, the place where this research is being done, uh, so it's a lab of NVIDIA, which is actually in New Jersey, not very far from here, about an hour drive from here, south of here. And their offices are located in the same Bell Labs building where I used to, to work back in the 80s when I worked on convolutional nets. In fact, the, the corridor they're occupying is the same corridor where my office was, used to be, which is kind of an incredible coincidence. It's not entirely a coincidence, I have to admit. Um, so a few years later, we figured perhaps this could be useful for you know, driving uh, cars. Uh, this, this idea of semantic segmentation, sort of figuring out what uh, you know, every region in an image is, like things like the road, the cars, the buildings, you know, we can train convolutional nets to do this. And we eventually worked on this and uh, published a few papers and that gave ideas to a number of companies. You know, I mentioned NVIDIA, but also uh, Mobileye, which is an uh, Israeli company that got bought recently by Intel. And they work on uh, uh, kind of vision systems for, for self-driving cars. Uh, and there is a big industry now, both in the US, in Europe, in China, in various corners of the world that work on self-driving cars. Every single one of them is using convolutional nets, every single one of them. So this is, you know, one piece of technology that um, has gathered a, a bit of a unanim unanimity in, in, uh, in terms of success. Um, but let me uh, show you some more recent work in computer vision uh, from, from Facebook. This is a, a, a class of work that, or a model called Mask RCNN, uh, which was uh, proposed by uh, Kaming He, the same uh, uh, gentleman I was mentioning before, uh, together with uh, collaborators at Facebook Air Research, including Ross Gershik, uh, the last author who came up with the original RCNN uh, idea. 
And I'm not going to go into the technical details, but show you some examples of what the system can do. It, it, it can basically run in real time on a single GPU. It can even run in real time, a smaller version of it, on a phone, uh, on iPhone. And it can do things like this, outline the, the contour of every object in the image with an identifi identification of it. it. I think it knows about 200 categories of objects. And it can you know, pinpoint the you know, things like wine glasses that are transparent and uh, objects that are partially occluded, um, objects that are of the same category that you know, overlap like the two persons, the TVs in the back, things like that. Um, it's really impressive what it can do. And if it's one of those examples where if you had asked people in computer vision 10 years ago, how long would it take before we can solve this? They say, well, we have no idea how we can solve this and it's probably gonna take 20 years. And you know, it happened very quickly. Uh, once people kind of got the idea that they could make those networks uh, work. You know, this thing can count sheep here on the, on the right, you know, it can do all kinds of really cool stuff. It can uh, estimate the pose of a person. Um, this is a, a slightly different uh, system, but it can do all of those tasks at the same time. And so there's a lot of applications of it. And another application that we use also at Facebook is for translation. So this is very useful. Some people here were tr translators. Um, the um, Facebook is in the, you know, one of the, the main mission of Facebook is to connect people across the world. And that means sometimes translating a post into, you know, from one language to another. Um, and um, we use, we use convolutional nets for that at Facebook. So um, some of the language pairs uh, that are translated by Facebook uh, use convolutional nets for translation. And this works really well. I'm not gonna go into the details of how this works because it's a little uh, complicated. There's mechanisms for attention and uh, et cetera. But it's basically uh, a convolutional net with a few tricks that um, does uh, translation. Um, the image recognition systems I was, I was showing you uh, before is actually um, used very, very widely at Facebook. So uh, people, um, so Facebook has about two billion users None of them in China, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, so two billion users across the world. Uh, Facebook users upload something, something like 1.5 billion photos on Facebook every single day. Every single photo uh, goes through four convolutional nets. Uh, one that identifies the objects and the scene, etc. This is for deciding whether a, per a person is meant, you know, is likely to be interested in a particular photo. Um, so we have to kind of tag all kinds of objects and you know, to decide whether uh, a picture is gonna be interesting for a particular person. Uh, second neural net uh, is used for filtering. So filtering pornography, violence, things like this. There's another one that's used for uh, generating textual descriptions of images for the visually impaired, for, for blind people. So, you go, to, you go to Facebook and if you're blind, you can't see the photos, but you can have a, a text that describes it to you. It can tell you how many people there are, if they look happy and et cetera. Um, the, and then the, um, the last one, which is only used in certain countries, does face recognition. So it allows you to tag your friends automatically on the photos that you upload. So it's very widely used and it, you know, it, it, it's uh, applied to every image is uploaded on Facebook within two seconds of it being uploaded. So that requires a lot of computation. There's a huge amount of work that goes into making sure the computation that's used for computing those neural nets is very, very efficient, as cheap as possible, um, because that consumes a lot of uh, resources. So one characteristic of the work we do at Facebook AI Research is that it's open research, so we publish all the research we do. We publish a good chunk of our code in open source, in fact, most of it. And these are a few examples of projects that we've uh, open sourced. Uh, one that's particularly relevant if you're interested in deep learning is PyTorch. This is the, a platform for training deep neural, deep neural nets and things like that. And it's uh, very flexible, very good for, for research and experimentation. But there's all kinds of things for text classification, for playing Go. We, ha we have a Go player that's actually used quite a lot um, in, uh, in China and um, in, in Asia in general. Um, it's not as, as uh, sophisticated as AlphaGo, but it's open source. Um, and then similarity search, deep mask that I was talk talking, talking about earlier. Um, so there's going to be a lot of applications of convolutional nets and neural nets in general and deep learning. Things like self-driving cars that I mentioned, medical and uh, signal image analysis. This is probably gonna have a huge impact on medicine, particularly on radiology. There's a lot of work on this. 
uh, bioinformatics and personalized medicine, speech recognition is already the case. All the speech recognition systems that you use when you talk to your smartphone, they all use neural nets. Um, a lot of them use convolutional nets, some of them use recurrent nets. Uh, translation, as I mentioned, um, robotics, and, and science. Uh, so there's an increasingly large number of projects that uh, to apply uh, neural nets to analyzing data for scientific purpose in physics, in biology, in, in uh, um, bio, um, um, you know, biological, bi biomedical research and uh, environmental protection, you know, all kinds of, uh, and social science also. Um, you know, a few examples, uh, some of them, some of those projects are at NYU, some not. So this is a project done by uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Kung Young Cho. I'm not involved in this work of detecting uh, tumors in, you know, breast cancer in uh, X-ray images. Uh, on the right is a project at Stanford um, for detecting, like recognizing uh, skin lesions and diagnosis. Um, let me skip ahead a little bit um, and talk about the, the future, or talk about the present research which may lead to future advances. There are obstacles to making real progress in AI. Uh, and the point I was making in the first slide was that uh, humans and animals learn in a very different way than, than the supervised learning model that I, I showed. Um, and one of the things we might be after is, again, get inspiration from biology, not trying to copy the brain, but like, you know, trying to sort of abstract some uh, basic principles that perhaps the brain might be using that we might kind of reproduce. And one question that, one hypothesis that we're working on is that there is some sort of underlying principle in, in how the brain uh, learns and how it works. Uh, some people don't believe this. There's a lot of people who believe that the brain is just a huge collection of hacks and it's just a result of evolution and there is no underlying principle and there's no way we can reproduce it. And, um, but I, I like to work on the opposite uh, hypothesis. And so, um, um, to cut to the chase, um, one, one thing that animals and people have is what we call common sense. And common sense is essentially our ability to fill in the blanks, to kind of complete information from partial information, right? So if you only see my right profile, you can pretty much guess what my left profile looks like because you know that most human faces are, you know, more or less symmetric, right? Um, you have a blind spot in your retina, but you're not conscious of it because your brain fills in the missing information there. Uh, but there is a spot in your visual field where you don't see anything. You, don't, you just don't realize it. Um, if I say a very short sentence, if I say, uh, uh, John picks up his bag and lev leaves the room. Um, you don't have to know anything about the room or about John or about his bag, but you can sort of represent yourself in your mind, the, the situation, and you can conclude a lot of things that John's probably going to stand up and is going to extend his arm and close his hand around his uh, bag handle and is going to walk, open the door, get out of the room. Once his out is not in the room anymore because a person cannot be in two places at the same time. That sounds obvious, but you actually learned that. You know, it's not going to fly away because people don't fly usually. It's not going to dematerialize. Um, you know, there are things like this that we know that we can fill in the blanks just from those few words. We can infer a lot of information about the, about the scenario because we know the constraints of the world. And that's what we call common sense, right? Common sense also allows us to predict what's going to happen. Uh, so we, we, you know, we get into a room and we have an immediate model of, physical model of, of uh, the situation and we can predict what's going to happen. So if I, take a, if I take an object like this one, which is rounded at the bottom and I put it here on the table and I tell you I'm going to let my finger go, you can all tell that the object is going gonna, is gonna to fall. What you probably can't tell is in which direction it's going to fall, okay? Because that might require uh, too much precision on, on the perception. So you don't know how I'm going to move my finger before I let it go. So that might be a little difficult. But, you know, we have intuitive physics notions uh, that uh, allow us to act in the world, to plan, to predict what's going to happen before it happens. And that's, to, to some extent, the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict. So there are very simple things that we learn when we're babies. We learn that, uh, you know, objects are still there even though they are out of sight or they are hidden the notion of object permanence. We learned this, you know, about the age of two months. Uh, we, uh, you know, which is why peekaboo is so funny when you're a baby, because you hide your face and you're not there anymore. Um, 
And you know, orangutans are pretty smart too. And you know, you can do magic tricks on them and they find that really funny. When, you, when a, you know, an object disappears that's supposed to be in a thing, you know, he's rolling on the floor laughing. So we learn this by just observing the world. We're not being told all of those things about the world. We just, uh, we just observe. And uh, you know, the notion of gravity, for example, that you know, when uh, an object is not supported, it's gonna fall. So here's something that you show to a baby. You show it before the baby is about eight months old. And the baby say, yeah, sure, why not? Hmm, fine. And then after eight months, when they figured out that there is gravity, that you know, they have a good model of whether objects fall or not, they look at this and they say, wait a minute, what's going on? What, what happened? Um, like they're very surprised. And you can measure how long they look at this and how big their eyes are. And, and that, that's how you know that they've learned the concept of gravity. And so uh, 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 a colleague uh, at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris is a cognitive scientist called Emmanuel Dupoux. And he came up with this um, chart of at what age babies learn particular concepts, like you know, tracking faces, uh, identifying um, animate objects versus inanimate objects. Um, that, that occurs around two, two or three months. Object permanence is about two months. Uh, objects that are rigid versus not is about two or three months. Uh, stability, whether an object is gonna stay up or fall, is about five months. And uh, things like gravity, it's more like eight months. Inertia, you know, sort of basic you know, physics, if you want. Um, and you know, it takes a while to learn all those things, and we learn by observation. How do we do this with machines? We have no idea how to do this with machines. So, um, let's see. So one explanation I have for this is, um, is the fact that when, when we learn by observation, when we observe the world, we train ourselves to predict what's gonna happen in the world. We are uh, asked, our brains are asked to predict a lot of information. They are asked to, we're given a huge amount of information about what happens next. It's basically the entire state of the world that we observe at every time step that we're trying to predict. And so the amount of information that's fed to a machine that is trying to predict the future or fill in the blanks is enormous. Um, and that's what we call unsupervised learning or predictive learning. When we use supervised learning, the amount of information we give to the machine every time we show it an example is relatively small. You know, we just tell it, you know, here is an image, and then we tell it there is a cat in here, and maybe a, a car. And so it's a small amount of information we're telling it. It's not like, you know, what is this picture going to look like uh, a second from now? Um, it's more like, you know, here is a few categories that are present. And then reinforcement learning is, is another mode of learning that, you know, is used a lot for games, for example, where basically the machine is only told whether what it did was right or wrong. It's, it's given a single number that indicates how well it's, it's doing. It's kind of like, you know, a reward that you give to a pet when you train a, a, you know, a circus animal or something like that. And there the amount of informa information you give to the machine is very small, so the machine has to do lots and lots and lots of trials before it succeeds. So AlphaGo, for example, the, the Go player produced by our, our friends at DeepMind uh, in London, um, you know, beat the world champion in China, actually. Um, and that machine played more games against itself than all of humanity in the last 3,000 years. So that's how it got good at it, is because you know, it could play millions and millions of games. Uh, but we can't do this in the real world. We can't have a machine, you know, like a robot arm uh, pick objects millions and millions of times before it uh, figures it out. We can't have a self-driving car crash into a tree millions of times before it figures out it's a bad idea to crash into a tree. So um, those techniques don't really work in the real world, but we are able to learn how to drive without crashing too many times, right, mostly. Um, so that led me to this analogy that, you know, if uh, intelligence is a cake or artificial intelligence is a cake, in terms of the amount of information that we ask the machine, that we give the machine when we train it, the, the bulk of the cake is this unsupervised predictive learning, whatever you want to call it, learning how the world works by observation. Uh, the icing on the cake is supervised learning, and then the cherry on the cake is reinforcement learning. And this is just a symbolization of the amount of information given to the machine at every trial. So the problem is we have a, a huge uh, challenge, which is that we know how to make the cherry, we can make the icing, but we don't know how to make the cake. And so this is kind of like physicists, um, you know, there's all those, you know, phys physical theories of what matter is about and what the universe is made of. And what physicists uh, have realized in recent years is that uh, ordinary, ordinary matter, like the normal stuff that the universe is made of, right? Like that's 
all the material in this room and ourselves, that's only 5% of the mass of the universe. The other 95%, we have no idea what it is. It's there, we can tell it's there. It's called dark matter and dark energy, but we have no idea what it is. So we're in the same situation as a physicist here, where you know the chocolate part here is the dark matter of machine learning. But we do work on reinforcement learning at Facebook. Um, you know, uh, last year and this year actually, uh, people from Facebook won the the Doom competition. So this is a competition where you know computers are supposed to play against itself. Uh, Doom. Um, we're working on StarCraft, very popular game. Um, on this side of the Pacific Ocean, also on, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, but ultimately what we need to do is uh, build um, uh, systems that are autonomous and more intelligent. And the architecture of an intelligent machine is something like this. You have your intelligent machine here, it interacts with the world, so it, it produces actions in the world. The world answers by producing percepts that are interpreted by a perception module, like a computer vision and things like this. It gives, you, it gives the agent an idea of the state of the world, and the agent has to decide what action to take so that eventually it's gonna be in a state that's gonna make it happy. And its, its happiness is measured by an objective function. So there's an objective function here that drives the behavior of the machine, of the agent, and uh, it's, you know, think of it as a measure of unhappiness. So if the value is low, the machine is happy, and if the value is high, the machine is not happy. And it's trying to kind of act on the world to bring the world into a state that is gonna bring itself into a state where it's happy, where it minimizes objective function, okay? And our brains are built this way. We have hardwired objective function at the base of our brain that drive us to do things like, you know, feed and drink and reproduce and, you know, wake up every morning and stuff like that. Um, but we also have a part of our objective function that is trained, so when we're when we are children, we're you know, being taught to distinguish you know, good from evil and stuff like that, right? And uh, that's a part of our objective function that is trained. So one question is what should be inside of this agent part of the system? Uh, and if we wanna build intelligent machines, agents have to be able to simulate what's gonna happen in the world before it happens. If you want to be able to plan a course of action, you have to be able to have a model of the world that you can use to simulate what's going to happen as a consequence of your actions, or just because the world is being the world and you don't have any influence on it. And so that's the part that we don't know how to build. That, you know, that, that's, that's what we build by observation. That's what babies and animals build by just kind of, you know, looking at the world, basically. Um, and that's what a lot of us are working on. We're working on building something like this for artificial intelligent systems. The other parts, we kind of know how to build them. Um, this is you know, something that generates action proposals and that's kind of a thing that predicts the long-term value of the objective. So, um, you know, um, you drive, you learn to ride a bike or you learn to ski and, you know, you can predict pretty well a few seconds in advance whether you're gonna fall or not. And you wanna be able to predict it before you fall. Because if you have to fall to uh, every time, you're gonna hurt yourself. So, uh, without going into details, uh, some of the stuff we're working on to learn what we call predictive forward models of the world. Uh, there's been some attempts a few years ago for, by a bunch of researchers at, at Facebook to, and there's a number of groups across the world who are working on this. Uh, these groups at Google, a group at uh, MIT, and, and various other places, University of Michigan. There's a number of groups that work on those uh, predictive models, but this is uh, some of the early work at uh, Facebook a few years ago, where um, you know, we would stack a bunch of uh, cubes and then observe how the cube fall or stay up, and then train a machine to predict what's gonna happen by just you know, letting the physics run, essentially. And this thing you know, was able to determine whether something is gonna fall or not, and in what direction, you know, with a pretty high level of accuracy. But you see kind of the prediction of how this tower is gonna fall is sort of fuzzy, right? So it doesn't quite know where the, the yellow cube is gonna fall out and it produces a fuzzy prediction because you know, it, there's an uncertainty about what's gonna happen. Um, so, let's see. Um, we're also applying this to dialogue systems, but I'm gonna skip this because I'm running out of time. So dialogue systems are a big, important topic of, of research. Let me just make a, a small parenthesis here. And uh, there's a lot of work at, uh, at Facebook, uh, in, in several groups at, at Facebook actually, uh, to use predictive models 
to uh, build dialog systems that actually have a little bit of common sense. We, we, we don't claim that the problem is solved at all. But basically by training a machine to predict what the other person is gonna say next, uh, the machine trains itself to have some understanding of really what is being talked about. And the team working on this, led by Jason Weston at Facebook here in New York, um, have worked on, on a system like this that can hold dialogues with, uh, you know, uh, on movies, for example, right? So, um, so you can ask questions about the system and, you know, it will, uh, you know, answer and you can sort of have some, some semi-intelligent dialogue with it. And what Jason has shown is that by having this predictive model, the system learns to kind of have you know, good dialogue faster than if, if you don't have that. Um, so, but let me go back to the g general question of how we get a machine to learn predictive models as well. Uh, and there's one new technique that appeared recently that was proposed by a gentleman called Ian Goodfellow, who at the time was a student with uh, my friend Joshua Benjo, University of Montreal, one of the big centers of research in deep learning. And it deals with the, the following problem, which is a very general problem in, uh, in, in machine learning or statistical estimation for that matter, which is that uh, let's say you want a machine to predict the future and you show it you know, a few frames of a video, for example, you know, me sort of putting a pen on the table and I'm about to let my finger go and then I ask the machine, what is the world going to look like half a second from now? And so by you know, being shown lots of examples of this kind of video, the machine can predict you know, the, the pen is gonna fall, obviously, but it can't really predict in which direction. So it's an example where the, the predictor that is supposed to predict the future you know, may make one prediction and then maybe something else will occur in the world. And all of those you know, possible predictions of the pen falling in all directions are all valid. They're all things that could have happened. It's just that you can't really tell exactly which one of those will happen. And so you'd like to find ways to train a machine in such a way that there is no single correct answer that you tell the machine, which is supervised learning, but you tell it all of those answers would be correct. You only want to punish the machine if the prediction is outside of this set of possible answers. And the problem is you have no idea how to characterize the set of possible answers. So the idea of adversarial training is that you train a second neural net to learn that set of possible answers. So the second neural net is gonna basically tell the first neural net your prediction is on the surface or is outside of it, and, uh, and, and the other one is gonna get the information about how to modify its output so as to come closer to the surface. That's the idea of adversarial training. I'm not gonna go into sort of, you know, much more details than this, because um, it's a little, a little technical, but, um, but essentially, um, this discriminator, this, this second neural net, is trying to make the difference, the, tell the difference between things that actually occur and things that are predicted by the, by the predictor. And of course, initially the predictor is really bad, and so the discriminator can tell, but eventually the predictor starts to get much better at making predictions that are essentially indistinguishable from what actually occurs in the real world, and the discriminator really can't tell the difference between them. Um, and so people, a few years ago, a group, uh, uh, one of the co-authors is at Facebook, um, came up with kind of a particular implementation of this, uh, called DCGAN, and they stunned the world a little bit by really opening the eyes of the uh, com research community on the capabilities of those techniques. Uh, so one of the things they did was train one of those predictors to map a random vector. So you draw a random vector, you run it through a neural net, and you train this neural net to produce the image of a bedroom. Why bedroom? Because they had thousands of images of bedrooms, okay? Um, and these are fake bedrooms. Those are bedrooms that are generated by this system. You feed a random vector and out comes the image of a bedroom. And you know, those images have everything that's required for a bedroom, right? They have beds, they have windows, they have dressers, they have lights, they have all kinds of stuff. Um, um, you can parameterize faces as well, um, generate faces. You can, um, uh, this is trained on a, a million images of various types and there you can't really make out what the objects are, but they kind of look like abstract art a little bit. Uh, this is if you train the same system on dogs, you get weird looking dogs, a little soft dogs. Um, and, and here's what happens when you try to train one of those systems to do video prediction. So if you train with a regular learning algorithm, uh, you get those blurry predictions that I was telling you about. But if you train with adversarial training, then you get these kinds of predictions. So here in every little, um, snippet of video here, you uh, the first four frames are observed, they're real, and then the last two frames are predicted by the system. 
and they are indicated by the red uh, contour. Uh, the predictions look reasonable. Um, you know, it, it can't predict long term in the future, but it does reasonable predictions. This is another example where this one has been trained on video segments from uh, apartments in New York. And as the camera turns, the system is supposed to predict what the apartment is going to look like when things turn red. This is a prediction. And it figures out how to invent the rest of this uh, books, the bookshelf here, which is kind of weird, right? It's figured out the, the, the structure of uh, apartments. This is another example of video prediction. This one is uh, trained on. So this one is not trained directly to predict pixels, but it's trained to predict the mask of objects produced by something like mask RCNN. In fact, uh, quite, you know, pretty much the same thing. And so this is very useful for, this would be very useful for self-driving car projects because this thing can predict that when a pedestrian starts crossing the street, eventually it's gonna continue crossing the street. Or when a car in front of you uh, start you know, turning left, it's gonna keep turning left. And so this is, very useful for driving. You, you'd like, if you want to build a self-driving car system, you'd like to be able to predict in advance what's going to happen so that you can take measures to prevent bad things from happening. If you see a driver on another lane kind of you know, driving erratically, you kind of stay away, right? Because you're kind of scared of what might happen. Um, or if there's a big truck, you kind of you know, pass by quickly because trucks are dangerous regardless of how good the, the driver is. So there's things like this that, that you know, you can learn by prediction because you have a, a model of the world. Sorry, and this is Professor. What, what this um, due to time restriction, we have to interrupt yep. you. Okay. Um, I'm actually done. So that was my last, uh, the last thing I wanted to say. Perfect timing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, wait. Okay. Now we're going to have Q&A session again. Thank you so much for your insightful speech. I'm sure many of you have questions for our professor. He just covered a lot of things in his slideshow. If you want to ask him anything, yes, please. Hi, Professor Lecun. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, very, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, uh, I recently read an article uh, about an interview uh, uh, with Jeffrey Hinton, Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, and he said something like, um, uh, for the deep learning method to improve, we kind of have to give up on back propagation and start over. So uh, my question is, what, uh, can you comment a little bit about that topic? And then uh, if you agree with him, uh, what do you think would be the future on alternative for that? Thank you. Yeah, well, I agree with him on many things. Okay, we, uh, I did my postdoc with him 30 years ago, and we, we have views that are very aligned on many, many topics. Um, uh, same with Yosha Benjo, you know, the, the three of us have kind of very similar view on where research should go. So the articles you might have seen are poor reflections of what he actually thinks about, about this, okay? And there is two ideas. There's one idea which is that he has this new idea, he's gonna publish it at uh, NIPS at the end of the year, uh, that he calls capsules. He's been working on this for many years. Um, there, there's, you know, some things that we're working on that are a little similar, which is the idea of kind of separating, trying to separate the ex explanatory factors of data. Um, and, you know, this is not something I talked about today, but um, kind of representing uh, the perceptual world with two types of uh, pieces of data. One is what is in the image, the other one is where, where it is, okay? And, and the, the capsule kind of generalizes this and puts it in this framework, okay, so that's one idea. So basically that would be an argument for, you know, classical neural nets should be kind of enhanced to do this. He's been a big advocate of unsupervised learning for many, many years. Uh, in fact, I, sk I skipped a slide where uh, the quote from him about this, why this is the, uh, and I have to admit uh, that he and I ha have had discussion about this for 30 years and for the first 10, I was not convinced at all <laughs> um, by, by his argument about unsupervised learning because I thought it was very ill-defined. Uh, but eventually I kind of, uh, you know, came to the same, the same opinion. Uh, he actually wrote, a, edited a book about unsupervised learning back in 1981. It was a long time ago. So he, he's been really kind of into this for a long time. Um, now, for the issue of backprop, uh, he has an idea that he hasn't really explained yet to anybody that uh, how to basically estimate gradients without using regular backprop. There is still gradient estimation as far as I can tell. He hasn't really told anybody about this yet, uh, other than the fact that it exists. Okay. Um, so. The, this, the three questions, in fact, I had this also on the slide that I skipped. So one is, uh, 
do we need to design learning algorithms that minimize objective functions? That's the first question. It's not entirely clear. It's not entirely clear the brain minimizes any objective function. The second one is, does it do it by estimating gradients? And it would be, sound kind of crazy not to estimate the gradient of an objective function you want to minimize. And then the third question is, how do you estimate the gradient? And there's a lot of people who are, you know, particularly neuroscientists and theoretical neuroscientists who are really interested in figuring out how, do you, can, you, know, how can you estimate gradients with neural circuit? Yosha Benjo is working on this. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Blake Richards at the University of Toronto who is working on this also, trying to discover how the brain evaluates gradients. Um, and I think, you know, Jeff has some other way of evaluating gradients. There is like, you know, half a dozen ideas that are floating around that none of them really work in practice, but they, or they, they work, but they're not particularly interesting in practice or over backprop. So we'll see if Jeff's idea is, is a different kind. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, I see another hand. Hi, Professor Akum. Uh, so I'm from JHU. So you talk about so we can use human being to train machine. Do you think you, we can use machine to train machine in the future? Well, one thing we can do with machines that is very hard with humans, at least uh, that's my experience as a professor, is that you can't really copy humans, okay? But you can copy a machine. So, uh, so one, one thing that is going to save us for some applications of, of machine learning, like said, driving cars, is that when one car has an experience, all the cars can profit from that experience because you can communicate the weights of the neural nets. You can, you know, do things like that, right? We can't really do this with humans. I mean, we can do it, but it's much more inefficient. You have to like go, go to school or read a book or whatever, and then experience it yourself. So, um, so that's an advantage that machines, uh, machine learning has over human learning. Um, uh, but eventually, yeah, I mean, machine can, can train machines, machines can train themselves by observing the world, uh, eventually, yeah. We have time for one more question. Okay, over there. Could you raise your hand again? Thank you. Hey, Professor, so um, my question is about uh, applying deep learning to uh, mission critical systems. And so like compare with like traditional rule-based systems, neural nets are more or less like predictable in some ways. And um, so like for things like self-driving cars or enterprise solutions that could be in disaster sometimes. So, and you talk about like adversarial training, it works well with like image-based data, but it's a little bit harder as far as I know for like text-based data. So I just want, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could share your thoughts on that. Uh, okay, but yeah, there's, there's a bunch of different questions that I'm going to unpack. So yes, adversarial training doesn't work very well for text yet, mostly because text is discrete and adversarial training is really designed for producing uh, data that is more or less in a continuous space. If it's a discrete space, there are other methods that kind of work better. You can represent easily distributions in discrete spaces. Um, and so there you don't need adversarial training for that purpose. But, uh, but there are attempts at doing this um, that have appeared in the last, uh, last year or so. Um, in fact, one of them that I've worked on that I haven't mentioned um, is called adversarially regularized autoencoders and it can be used to generate text uh, with adversarial training. The adversarial part is on the code of the autoencoder, not on the output. Um, so that it's on archive. It's not published in any conference or anything, but it's on, uh, his paper is on archive. Uh, first author is uh, Jake Zhao. He's, um, uh, he's a student, uh, PhD student with me. He actually went through the masters in data science. So he's, he's from China. He's from, uh, um, uh, you know, he, he did the masters in data science at NYU and then uh, did very well, did a couple of research projects with me and then eventually um, I took him in the PhD program in computer science. Now we also have a PhD program in data science uh, since this year. Um, uh, it's, very, it's very nice work. Now your, your other question about mission critical uh, systems there is a question of how you test the reliability of systems that have been trained as opposed to completely programmed. So, uh, you know, I have uh, friends at NYU, colleagues at NYU who work on uh, formal methods and verification for uh, software. So one of my colleagues, you know, wrote uh, a, a software verification system that is used routinely by, uh, uh, you know, EADS or, you know, um, people making the Airbus airplanes, right? They, they have three different implementations of every code that they have for the, all the software in the, in, the, in the airplane, and all of those are verified by those formal methods. So you can do this for regular programs. You can't really do this for machine learning systems. 
uh, because most of the functionality is learned and there is no formal verification of it, right? So the question of what are the proper procedure to train to, to figure out the reliability of a system and then correct it when it doesn't work is not entirely figured out. Um, you know, that probably the people working on self-driving cars are probably going to figure this out first. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Let's give him another round of warmest applause. Thank you. Thank you.